Rachel and today we're going to talk about middle grade books. Recently, last month, there were a lot of conversations around middle grade books. Two distinct conversations I want to point out to you. So number one was the conversation of is middle grade dead? Is middle grade the age range of books published for that range of kids, that age range? Is it dead or dying? There were a lot of opinions on this, particularly from folks who write middle grade. And then the second conversation was whether or not books are being marketed appropriately and whether or not there is content in middle grade books. Now I think what I think what kickstarted this conversation was a particular man on TikTok decided to get on and say is anybody on this godforsaken app reading anything that isn't Bonk which just shows that he is not engaging with book talk in a way that is in anything other than bad faith. There is a variety on book talk just because there is a very popular well-known side of book talk that reads spicy literature. That does not mean that all of book talk is spicy literature. There's nothing wrong with literature that man would disagree but then in order to make his point he started to go down the route of well they're putting in middle grade books which is categorically not a thing and in order to further make this point which he could not he decided to say well they're marketing covers that look like middle grade that are adult books one that got brought up was icebreaker and honestly i found this conversation just utterly sickening because what i think you all are doing is doing moms for liberty's work for them you are saying that there are books that are dangerous and instead of you saying hey the problem is that parents individually need to know what their kids are consuming you all have decided certain kinds of animation and certain kinds of art are only for kids and if we use them for adults then that's confusing and the adults shouldn't do their job and their due diligence I'm gonna come back to this because I'm already getting <laughs> So let's go back to the is middle grade dying. So the original tweet that asked this was, okay, y'all, I'm asking this seriously because I can't comprehend. Why is it exactly that middle grade is dying? How can this be possible? Is the entire population of eight to 12 readers just going to cease to exist? Will readers go straight from Junie B. Jones to YA? Make it make sense. So there's a couple comments in here that think that middle grade is dying and their case for this was the price, honestly, people don't wanna pay $20 for a hardcover. But then other people came to say, it's not dying, it's down 2%. Readership spiked during 2020 and has slowly tapered off since then. Back to more normal numbers, I would not call it dying. Downtrends are just part of the cycle. If we keep writing, they will keep reading, at least I hope. I do hear a lot about graphic novels filling the gap, especially for boys, but plenty of middle grade books are flourishing, so maybe nobody's actually asking the middle graders. For a tiny sample size, my niece, late elementary, is into middle grade and early YA while my nephew sticks to graphic novels. So again, just like she said, tiny sample size. I have two nieces and I have two kids, two boys. So my five-year-old cannot yet read. He will be going into kindergarten and starting to next year. My seven-year-old can read and he is into majority graphic novels. So I am trying to get him into chapter books, but he leans, he gravitates toward graphic novels and I want to instill a love of reading. So I try to buy what he loves. He is really into school trip is one that he's reading right now. Most of his favorites are dog man or the cat kid comic book, comic club. He did ask to to read one that I was reading which was a graphic novel called Band Book Club but I think that this is not inappropriate but just not able to be understood by him so he's sticking with middle grade graphic novels for now however I do feel like this despite not being a uh, for a middle grade audience I would give it to my 13 year old niece and even my 11 year old niece and my 13 year old niece is trying to read more YA and I'm trying to find her ones that are age appropriate so for instance uh, Lainey Taylor's books like Daughter of Smoke and bone her dad bought oh my god there's so much dust so my niece's dad bought um days of blood and starlight and unfortunately that is not age appropriate for a 13 year old so uh it, it's gonna have to live on the shelf i'm gonna ask them to give it to me and i will trade them for a more age appropriate book but again this it goes back to what i'm saying earlier the parents are the ones that need to be actively involved here but it makes sense to me that all we're seeing really is we saw a spike during covid and now we're going back to normal numbers that that makes sense. But there were some quote tweets I wanted to point out. Middle grade is not dying, but I have heard from multiple people that it's very hard to sell middle grade novels to publishers right now. I don't know if that's true or not though. I'd love to hear what other people's experience of this has been lately. From conversations with you 
U.S. publishing people. The U.S. middle grade market does seem to be in serious trouble at the moment. It'll adapt though. The downs are never forever. UK is down too, but not quite so much, I think. Esme Simon Smith, who writes middle grade books, said middle grade isn't dying. Middle grade has more staying power than any other age category. The issues, issues with middle grade, in my opinion, is the rising price of books. Barnes & Noble not stocking new hardcovers, and the New York Times basically list being basically stationary, but no, middle grade is not dying. And somebody said, sure, but it's nearly impossible to sell middle grade right now. It's one of my favorite arenas to write, yet established authors, their agents can't sell their manuscripts, so practically there's a massive contraction in what's getting published right now, and Barnes & Noble is the main reason. And Esme said, yes, because of the above reasons, I believe. I'm trying to get like a variety of voices, so like authors, parents, but also people who like work in collection development. This person's name is Kit. They said, let's talk about middle grade and collection development because it sometimes feels hard to find the books, but I promise they are there. I can't say enough about Edelweiss because it allows me to read books way ahead of time and build out those orders. Getting those arcs is key. Social media is also a huge boon. I found authors through getting arcs and then their social media accounts have been pointed towards so many additional phenomenal authors and titles. Middle grade is tricky because 8 to 12 covers a vast array of reading levels, plus the interest of kids in that range is all over the map, which honestly is what makes it so fun to be a librarian for that group. They are passionate and curious, and it's on me as a librarian to get books in front of them, and that's work. But we are incredibly lucky that middle grade authors are also passionate people who really want to get it right and create these books that are aimed square at our middle grade kids. The publishers and suppliers don't always do a good job curating middle grade, but the books are there and they are amazing. Debut author Bethany Baptiste, who has a book coming out um, this month. It is a YA book, not middle grade, sorry if that was confusing, um, but they are, uh, she's an educator, so I thought I would give her perspective as well. From an educator perspective, much of middle grade is only accessible to a small amount of children who read above their grade level and can handle longer books. Why? Because middle grade for quite some time has been written for adults. Text complexity is too high and book length is too long. For a long time now, we not only have a generation of children that's reading below their grade level, we also lack of a variety of middle grade books with accessible prose that matches a, lo a low reader's level of maturity and age-based interests. Middle grade books will accessible prose is viewed as too young by TradPub when in actuality it's right on target for many readers. This is what happens when educators and librarian aren't at the table when TradPub decides what kid lit books to publish. But not just that because there's a lot of books that are too advanced and too long for children in that age range, educators and librarians with limited budgets, book bans, and classes full of children who are struggling, readers, etc. are left with little options. They are not going to continue to buy new middle grade books if the vast majority of the children they serve can't read them. They are not going to buy middle grade books for only a handful of students who can read middle grade books that are actually geared more towards adults. But educators and librarians have been ringing this alarm for a long, long time now, and Trad Pub simply refuses to listen. What people fail to realize is that even though bookstore sales or middle grades are important, the main customers for KidLit are schools and librarians. Librarians and educators aren't booksellers. Booksellers stock the book on their shelves with the hope it sells. Librarians and educators purchase one or more copies of the book, so these are guaranteed done deal sales. Trad Pub somewhat tries hard to appeal to educators and librarians. However, However, when they continue to publish books that are inaccessible to young readers, they are not trying hard enough. This has to do with the fact that TradPub doesn't think about the kids who read the books, they're thinking about the adults who will purchase the books. The other issue is a lot of middle grade authors throw fits when educators and librarians point out that the advanced long books aren't benefiting young readers. I've literally seen folks on here subtweet or argue with educators and librarians about this and talk over them. Which is a lot of nerve because the same middle grade authors act be acting damn terrified of kids, especially the ones that don't fit their ideal audience, and you know exactly what I mean. If middle grade is dying, it's because TradPub, agents, editors, and authors thinks it knows better than educators and librarians who've been warning them for years. So I'd be super interested in hearing what you all think of that and let me know if your perspective is from a librarian, an educator, a parent, particularly a parent of kids who are currently reading middle grade, or if you are somebody who works in publishing. There is a Publishers Weekly article that I wanted to read. So it says the shifting middle grade market and this is by Joanne O'Sullivan from June 16, 2023. So about a year ago. Middle grade readers are often called the golden age of reading, but while there have been a number of surprising breakout YA hits in the past several years, overall the middle grade category has fallen behind. According to Circana Bookskin, 2022 ended with year over year middle grade sales down 16% overall and 19% in hardcover. This year has seen overall middle grade sales down 8% year over year, while hardcover sales in this category are down 7% for an $18.8 million decline. Frontlist has been a particular concern to publishers, editors, and agents, accounting for more than half of the decrease in sales in the 12 months ending March 
March 2023, 33% of the top 200 middle grade titles were frontlist, while 67% were backlist. The frontlist is dominated by familiar names Max Brellier, Jeff Kinney, Dave Pilkey, J.K. Rowling, Reina Telgemeier, and those names hold sway over much of the backlist too. The only ones I recognize there are obviously fuck J.K. Rowling, but Dave Pilkey is one, one that I certainly recognize. I mean, Dave Pilkey books are just, my house is covered in them. My kid is obsessed with Dave Pilkey books. I'm not complaining. If that sounds like a complaint, it's not. I am super happy. I mean, I just wish that I could get him to read the, the like, I'm still, I have so many, like, younger books that I would still love to sit and read with him, but he's just really into Dave Pilkey and, and graphic novels. Last summer, there was an outcry from middle grade author community on social media over speculation that Barnes & Noble had implemented a new policy that would specifically reduce the number of middle grade hardcovers it purchased. Barnes & Noble's senior director of strategy says no such policy exists and the retailer has been exercising a book by book evaluation across all categories since 2019 with local stores deciding what to buy for their communities. A few authors were agreed that their books were not stocked, mostly by deliberate choice, and characterized this to be due to a policy against hardcovers in general. In fact, we now simply try to buy hardcovers in the quantity we judge will likely be bought by our customers. Still, rumors persist. Marilyn Robbins, children's book buyer and program manager at the Bookies in Denver, says she knows of a publicist who bought every copy of her client's hard book, hardcover book in her hometown Barnes & Noble locations, believing that if a single copy was purchased, the retailer would buy three more of the title. That's not the case, says uh, the Barnes & Noble senior director of book strategy. The replenishment is dependent on the individual bookseller who oversees inventory for their home stores. Barnes & Noble CEO James Daunt told Publishers Weekly in a recent interview at the lower price point in, in a format friendlier to children themselves, some titles that will struggle to sell in more than very small quantities in hardcover will be better served if published in paperback. It is not all one thing or another, but a common sense judgment to be made by the publisher. One of the biggest challenges for publishers and authors appears to be what Sir Canna Books fan industry analysis called break in the chain of peer-to-peer -peer discovery because of the pandemic. For some, that happened at a particularly crucial time in their development as readers. Oh, that's a good point. Yeah, I could see that being an issue. I don't think it's possible to overstate how disruptive the pandemic was on middle grade readers. They lost most of their main source of discovery, including bookstores, teachers, librarians, and seeing what their friends were reading. And at the same time, they spent lots of time on screens of all sizes. See, that's interesting because I feel like that's kind of in conflict with what was being said on Twitter was that it went up during COVID. And I would assume that that's because kids were bored at home and their parents were ordering books. Simultaneously, the pandemic affected publishers' ability to get attention for their new titles. We've always relied on Publishers Weekly, Kirkus, The New York Times Book List, and other outlets to give wide coverage to hard grade middle grade hardcover middle grade fiction. But the collective coverage has shrunk since the pandemic for whatever reason. So now most books are lucky to get one or two reviews when in the past they would have gotten five or six. So many novels are getting two starred reviews, but those are only the two reviews they get. When it takes four or five starred reviews to actually move the needle, this is infinitely frustrating. The decrease in reviews has a number of downstream effects, particularly in the school and library market, which has a huge impact on middle grade sales. Gatekeeper accolades such as starred reviews, selection for state lists, the Indie Next list, ALA awards, and so forth move the needle. But that all tends to happen after the on sale date, so the awareness of a title doesn't resonate in time to create big first week sales and launch a debut onto bestseller list. Oh, I can see how that's a problem, yeah. One of the challenges in the middle grade market may come down to demographics. The success of the YA category has been bolstered by adult readers, while middle grade doesn't enjoy that same age range creep. And statistically, there are fewer children in the middle grade age category today than there were five years ago. Oh, I didn't think about that. Readers are aging out of the category and not being replaced in equal number. See, I didn't even think about that as a possibility. Plus for tweens, there's a tendency to reach for books with characters who are older than them. And again, that is completely up to their parent. I've noticed that it, often that young middle grade readers tend to want to read up maturity and content wise, including my own kids. They will shy away from books who even though the main character may be their age and gravitate more towards mature characters. One friend said her daughter who loves to read wouldn't read one book where the main character was the same age as her because the cover was too babyish. And they do talk about graphic novels, saying they're easier to sell. Graphic novels have an inherent promotional advantage over prose novels given the amount of art available to use in creative assets like social media graphics and book trailers. I suspect that likely has a part to play in the continued success of graphic novels. It's easier for readers to see at a glance why they might want to read one. There's still a hungry market out there for these books, so look for opportunities to refresh and rediscover middle grade. Think about new voices and new stories. And also think about like the people that you're serving, the middle grade readers. I would just add on to that. I am not going to put in here the TikToks from that man on TikTok who wants your views, but there was a similar conversation about moving back into the middle grade books, uh, look like adult books 
conversation, I'm going to show you what I saw. There have been stories of parents buying Icebreaker for 12 year olds because it seems appropriate based on the front cover. Some other books are even less telling to be honest, that's what I'm saying. How widespread is this problem of people miss missing category, placement, description, blurb, comp titles, setting, and protagonist age to buy Icebreaker for 12 year olds? Who is ultimately being served by creating a moral panic around adult books ending up in kids hands? I'm going to stop right there because the whole reason that I think that this is an important conversation is that right there because this is the exact and I'm not joking I am not exaggerating this is the exact same thing that I am having to go and drive 30 minutes to downtown Tampa and walk into my school board on Kennedy Boulevard and explain to my children's school board because people show up and they make the exact same argument that is being made in this thread and it is a bad faith argument it is also the same argument that I had to explain to down the road from my school board at my commissioner's office because one of my commissioners said that he believed that it's a problem that a 12 year old can walk into a library and pick up an adult book and it was explained to him by other parents including other parents who are commissioners he's not a parent and that's the problem is that parents are not getting centered in this conversation he was ex it was explained to him you are running down a very slippery slope sir because what you are saying is that parents are somehow not given every opportunity to do their job this is an issue that I just feel has completely fallen through the cracks I, I heard some of the comments too especially bringing the the Bible in and I uh, you know I, I'm not gonna bite on that uh, but what I will tell you the books that I'm about to go over um, are very far from the Bible um, the these books uh, I had an eight-year-old pull okay uh, in access online and these books are available in the library system um, I do not think any commissioner here, or even the parents that spoke, will say that there is any value in any of that literature that is readily available to young people. And when I say young people, from, from as, as young as you can have a library card. And also, Andrew, I want to also reiterate, and I'd like you to clarify, because some people said that you're always accompanied with a parent as a minor. That's not true from what I heard from you. Could you please explain that real quick? Yeah. We, we do have policies in place uh, that... Uh, prohibit someone under the age of 12 from being in the library without a parent or guardian. Um, and uh, we work very diligently to enforce that. Um, however, that, you know, kids can in the library. Um, after that, though, at that age, it's a behavior related uh, response to children in the library. So over the age of 12, uh, a minor could in fact be in the library uh, on their own recognizance. Yeah. Um, we do have some teen programs in the afternoon after school to direct the behavior. Um, but after the age of 12, 13 and older, kids can be in the library unattended. Well, and, and let's talk about that too. So, so a 13-year-old could come in and be unattended. Is that fair to say? Yes. Okay. And as far as, as the books, um, these authors provide age ranges, right, on what's appropriate for a child. Could you talk about that real quick? Sure. Um, uh, when a book is published, there's usually some kind of age designation. And, and I'll be clear also, we're primarily talking about fiction content. We're not talking about the general nonfiction, which is where religious texts would be found in, the, in, in our libraries anyway. Exactly. So the, uh, we're talking about fiction content. So books that come into the library are rec have recommended ages by publishers, usually in broad categories, by, for juvenile readers, teen readers, adult readers. And we uh, generally use those when we uh, when we add those to how we divide the library up with classification. I think the word is age appropriate content. Age appropriate content. Is that fair yes, to say? absolutely. And I've gone over some of these books that, uh, again, I had an eight-year-old pull these books, mm -hmm. okay? And uh, I, 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 was, I was mortified. You know how I feel about that. Um, the book Guilty Pleasures by Deborah Mello, uh, is that available to, let's say, an eight-year-old online um, or, or in the library? Yeah, I believe that's only available as a digital book, and it is available to anyone with a library card. Okay. Um, commissioners, I've provided this information to you. I, I have been advised uh, not to read this. Uh, I can assure you, it, to, to me, it is pornography in a book. Uh, that's the only way that I know how to say it, and I know it's one of those, those things where I know it when I see it, uh, to use an old legal term. Hello, I'm going to interrupt this balding, stupid, fucking idiot who spoke over a bunch of parents, and then my commissioner, my personal commissioner, who sits directly next to him, eventually explained to him, Michael, this is a slippery slope that you're on, sir. 
Um, I eventually got in trouble at this meeting for calling out. You have you the burden of proof is on you. You have to provide evidence that this is an actual problem because uh, this is actually the greatest example that I could have ever hoped for of conserv conservatives um, manufacturing a problem because he just admitted to you that he sent in an eight year old to pick out those books, sent in an eight year old, sent in an eight year old on the app to pick out porn. Uh, under his definition, okay? Um, as an actual parent, which again, Michael Owen is not, I would never do that. I would never manufacture a problem that is not happening on its own to make a bad faith argument. You'd never see it. Um, especially um, when that <laughs> entire argument hinges upon somebody's child and some, some parent deciding to uh, be part of this and send their kid in to do that. I find that utterly despicable on all accounts. All parties are to blame and they all owe that eight-year-old an apology. Um, that is not a legal term. I know it when I see it, it's not a legal term. It was said by a Supreme Court justice. That doesn't mean that it isn't stupid inherently because what I know it when I see it is, is like the perfect example of subjectivity. Because if we do not have a basic definition of what something means, then we all get to decide what our own definition is. And that's where we run into legal problems that, again, down the street from this office that, again, I'm sitting in this room right now, um, down the street, okay, we're having a constant argument at the school board about what porn is. And the people who show up claiming that there's porn in my kids' schools um, make their own definition. And then they claim, well, it's the law. But the problem is that the law is too vague. And I know it when I see it is making the law more vague. I want the law to be explicitly clear on what pornography is. Unfortunately, Florida can't do that because then they don't have wiggle room to be able to have conservatives come in and say, well, I know it when I see it, everything I feel is porn is porn. So that's where we're running into issues, Michael and everybody listening. What was the other thing I wanted to complain about that he said? I don't remember. I don't remember. I have so many complaints. I've not been able to walk back in there because, to be honest, I'll fucking fight, okay? Um, I stood there, and I got told that basically I'm allowing my kid to be in a position where I'm, I'm feeding them porn. That's what that meeting was. By a non-parent, bald-headed ass. You know what? I'm going to stop. I'm going to stop because I'm getting heated. I'm actually, I have sat on this video um, it's currently May. I've sat on this video because I don't want to make it. I don't want to talk about this because it's so many non-parents coming and making bad faith arguments. And if you don't have a bad faith argument, you will manufacture a place in which a child comes across something they should not have. What are we doing? How is this reality? Oh my God, as a parent, I want to fucking throw up. The last point I want to make is that an eight-year-old by themselves would never have picked up all those books he's complaining about. The only reason that an eight-year-old did was because Michael Owen, a non-parent, asked someone else's child to do that in order for Michael Owen to prove a point about a problem that does not exist that he himself manufactured so that he could get on the county commissioner's little, little seat there and complain about woke Disney and the Woke Library Association, the uh, Marxist Library Association. And I stood there with my bitch ass and I said, I don't think you can define that word, dumbass. So that's what happened. And unfortunately, what I'm getting at is that, number one, somebody's parent fucked up because it was the parent's responsibility not to take part in this. And it's also the parent's responsibility that all the other eight to whatever you know, whatever book we're talking about, whatever age range it's not for, does not have their child pick up that book. My kid's in the other room reading right now. My mic be, might be picking him up, actually. He, <laughs> he's reading stuff, a stack of books, looks like this. It's all books that I have picked for him. I pick everything he reads. It's not hard. It's my job. It's my responsibility. And that's what I stood there and told Commissioner Michael Owen. It's my job. That's my responsibility as a parent. And what I said specifically was every single resource has already been given to me. I have been accommodated like you would not believe. And Anthony, the library uh, leader, the other guy who's speaking, 
has made that happen for us. And actually, after this meeting, because I'm a parent who actually gives a shit about this issue, after this meeting, I then attended the next library board meeting and showed up and said, Anthony, this feels like bullshit to me. This feels like some non-parent dumbass who orchestrated a problem and decided to bring me into it when I didn't ask. I didn't ask and I'm doing my job. So why do I need some asshole, some dumb asshole who cannot define the word Marxism but throws it around as if it's a problem to make more rules about what my child can and cannot access? I already have enough of those policies I am com in complete control already. So what is Michael Owen actually doing here by sending in somebody else's eight-year-old to pick out porn and orchestrate a problem? What are we talking about? <laughs> so um, this has been an ongoing problem and I have been sitting on it for a while because I'd like to talk about this in a broader video, but I'm bringing it in now um, before I talk about it in a longer video about the library in particular because, and I called this shit, at the last school board meeting where we were standing there because to um, well particularly one non Hillsborough County Schools parent has been repeatedly trying to get p books pulled out of school um, her little friend showed up at this meeting where they were deciding whether blankets by Craig Thompson and identical by Ellen Hopkins would stay or go in the high schools um, <laughs> And uh, they they brought up that, <laughs> this was so fucking funny. They were on one hand, some of them were like, we're just talking about the public schools library. We think that you can do whatever you want with your children outside of the public schools, but not with my tax dollars. But then on the other side, like this, these same bitches that are sitting next to you are saying, well, the public library, they did something about this, so why don't you? What are you talking about? Every parent already has every accommodation to make it work for them, to, to make sure that their kid is only reading stuff that they deem appropriate. What are you talking about? And second of all, you just told on yourself because it's not just about the public school libraries, is it now? No, it's also about the public library system. And Michael Owen orchestrated a problem that you then said, yeah, it's a problem. I, I don't want, I, I think that more rules are needed, even though they're not, <laughs> they're not needed. And then on top of that, just a couple months after this, uh, the little free libraries were under attack. And now in Hillsborough County, you can't have a little free library on Hillsborough County Public Parks property because some stupid, bigoted asshole got upset that there was a rainbow painted on the outside of one of them. So this is, th these are the people that you are helping when you, <laughs> you feed into this kind of rhetoric. Don't help them. They don't need help. Please don't do that. All right, I'm done. It is my job to ensure that my kids are reading age appropriate stuff. It is not the job of a company. I just, this is so silly. Why are we not saying parents do your jobs? I am a parent. Tell me to do my job. I'm doing it. In fact, let me show you something. I grabbed you a few examples. All right, we're going to talk about all of them. This is a book called K is for Knife Ball by Avery Monson and Joran John. This is the back of the book. This is the front of the book. Now, as a parent, it is my job to look at this book and decide whether or not this is appropriate for my kids or not. This was given to me as a joke. It's a joke. It's for adults. This book is not for children of any age. It has things in it like C is for cop with a big shiny gun. Sneak up and tickle him. That'll be fun. You will never find K is for knife ball in the children's part of any library. This is not a book for kids. Now it looks like one because that's the joke. I as a parent have a job to make sure that this is not a book that I read to my kids and if my kid says can I read that book I say no you can't. That That's it. That's, that's the solution. And on top of that <laughs> The problem is, there is no problem. My kid has never asked to read this. And that's what I'm saying in that tweet. This, it, it has not fallen into my child's hands. So I'm not going to say we need to lock this up behind bars because the problem that y'all are claiming is happening is not happening. And also, if it happened once, that is considered an outlier in the data and we don't make generalized rules for everybody else based on outliers in data. I would not say this book needs to be banned because my kid snuck in here and stole it off my shelf. That would never, ha that is ridiculous. That's an outlier in data. That's bad 
bad parenting. That's me not doing my job. We don't make rules based on me not doing my job. But unfortunately, that is what people are starting to do. And I don't understand how book Twitter has started to make the same arguments that people who are for restricting books are making. Because when I had to go down to the commissioner's office and explain to Commissioner Michael Owen, sir, you cannot make it harder for kids to check out books based on a hypothetical. You have to, and I yelled this out in, in the meeting and I got in trouble for it. I said, you have to, the burden of proof is on you to demonstrate that this is a systematic problem that kids are walking into the library and picking up books and somehow getting them past their parents and reading them and being harmed by them. You would have to systematically prove that that is a problem over and over in order for it to be appropriate for us to take measures beyond just saying, parents, parent your own kids. That That is that is the truth of it. In response tweet, which I feel hit the nail on the head, we got, it is widespread enough for it to be an issue in my opinion. This is what pissed me off. In your opinion is meaningless in this situation. In your opinion is the same thing I hear from Julie Gebhard's My Resident Counter County Book Banner who shows up and says, well, I think that these books are harmful and I want them removed because even though my kids don't go to school in this district, your kids do and I want your kids to be in an educational environment to create a very specific kind of kid because eventually your kid will interact with mine. That's the bad faith argument being made and it's all based on Julie's opinions. I have to tell you that when it comes to kids, please listen to me as a parent, I don't give a shit about your opinions, I care about evidence. And that should not be some wild statement to make. P opinions are moot. Opinions are moot here. When it comes to harm, harm to children, we have to listen to what evidence says. I don't care about random people's opinions when it comes to uh, dictating rules surrounding my kids. I want my right to parent and I don't want other people's feelings and opinions starting to dictate what environment my kids grow up in because I experienced that growing up. I grew up in a very restrictive environment in evangelical fundamentalism where I went to extremely restricted media schools and received curriculum that was so be I can't even explain to you a Becca within a, a 30 second bit that would help you to understand. I grew up in the kind of environment that book banners would like to see repeated. Over my dead body would I allow that for my kids. And that's the slippery slope that we're heading down and I won't have it. Please stop engaging in this. It's so inappropriate and it's not centering the rights of parents or kids. That's anecdotal at best and is taking the responsibility of monitoring and making decisions for their children out of a parent's hands and placing it on a genre and an art style. It is a wild conclusion to come to and one that only serves book banners and purity culture. That's just true. That is just true. And I know because I experienced it. Everybody who grew up in evangelical fundamentalism did. They responded by saying, I don't think it's purity culture to be concerned that children aged 11 to 15 are reading books that are wildly inappropriate for them. I still think it's a responsibility of the parents, but all these things play a part in it. It's not just one. One, you have to prove that. Number two, it is only the responsibility of a parent, period. The parent can see the art style and then still have a job to do period it is not on a publisher please don't do that do not take the responsibility out of my hands and place because that's when we start getting rules on companies and who is going to dictate those rules who do you think that that power is going to end up in the hands of it's not going to be you or I it is going to be people who create the educational environment that I grew up in which was purity culture and for the record people like myself are concerned with children reading books that are wildly inappropriate for them, which is why individually it is up to each parent to make sure that that is not happening. It is not the community's job to make sure that there are laws and rules and restrictions in place on companies to dictate that. That is on each individual parent. Now, personally, I know a parent who allowed her 12, 13 year old, 14 year old to read Haunting Adeline. This is not something I would do. However, if that parent wants to, if her daughter came to her and said, I want to read this. Her mom said, I don't want you to read that. I will read it first and then we can talk about it. They engaged in a conversation the whole way through. I would never do this. However, I respect her right as a parent to do what's best for her kid because I'm not raising her kid. And also she did her responsibility and her due diligence every step of the way in ensuring that there was open communication between her and her kid. And that's way healthier than shutting down conversation entirely and taking the responsibility out of the hands of the parents. It's just not 
not appropriate what we're advocating for. In the case of something that could look like a younger book but is not, I have a good example. So recently I bought Banned Book Club. I thought that this was going to be a middle grade book. It is not. And the only way that I found that out before deciding whether or not to give it to my own kids who are seven and five and my nieces who are 13 and 11 was by reading it. I would never just hand over a book to my kids or even not my kids, my nieces without doing my research first. I would never ever do that. That is my responsibility as an adult. It is not the responsibility of a company. It is not the responsibility of my local library, unlike what Commissioner Michael Owen thinks. It is not the responsibility of my school's librarian to take away anything that makes my resident county book banner uncomfortable. I can make, if I am uncomfortable, then I can make a plan with my librarian. And there are things that I do not let my child read. So for instance, my five-year-old cannot read anything with zombies in it. He's too scared. My seven-year-old, perfectly fine. So I have talked to my media specialist. Shout out our media specialist. I absolutely love that woman. And I have told her I can't have younger kid reading zombie stuff. So keep him away from the Dave Pilkey books just in case and have him read literally anything to do with uh, Gabby's treehouse or what is that called? Gabby's dollhouse. And he really likes Blippi and he really likes Paw Patrol. So at home, sometimes we will read a Dave Pilkey book, but only ones that I have previously looked through to make sure that he won't get scared by something. Um, my seven-year-old is afraid of death. So uh, nothing about death. Uh, it's on each individual parent to know what their kid can and cannot handle and do their due diligence by looking inside the book and deciding whether or not it's right for their kid. That That is my job. That is entirely my job. It would be utterly stupid of me to only be looking at covers and deciding whether or not that's appropriate for my kids. Parents shouldn't be doing that. And you, everybody should be holding parents to a higher standard than that. I'm sorry. The fact that this, uh, that we should be going after like the marketing, changing the marketing, changing the genre, changing publishing, when that's up to the parents, you are not only take, parents have a right to parent their kids. It's not just a job. It's also a responsibility and a right so that you can do it how you see fit, but you're still supposed to do it. What you're not supposed to do is make those choices for other people's kids. And that is the direction we are going in with this. And instead, another person has decided that they are going to say that it's about um, being concerned about kids 11 to 15 reading books that are wildly inappropriate for them. Trust me when I tell you that I have my job under control. I can do that. I do not need any non-parents advocating for changing uh, rules and, and animation and art styles to make it like to make me lazier. <laughs> I still have to do my job. Like I, there are cartoons that I do not let my kid watch. I watch Archer. This is an animated TV show. This is not for children. I watch Bob's Burgers. Some people let their kids watch Bob Burgers. I don't. I have never watched BoJack Horseman. I wouldn't let my kid watch this. South Park is not for kids. Now this, Young Justice, is a great show that is a little bit too old for my kids as far as like, I don't know, maybe some violence. But honestly, my kids are watching My Hero Academia with their dad. So we allow Young Justice too. There's another example. My Hero Academia. It's got a lot of blood in it. My kids are fine with it. Other people's kids might not be fine with it. And other people's parents might just be uncomfortable themselves and not want their kid to engage in that. That's fine. I personally don't like that show, so I don't watch it. But they watch it with their dad and my kids are fine. We have a plan in place that works individually for our family and our particular kids. And here's the thing. If you want to advocate for helping kids, the fastest, best, most efficient, efficient way to do that is by making sure that their parents have every resource and opportunity available to them to learn about the media because nobody is going to know the child in question better than their parent or guardian. Therefore, the resources have to go to the parent or guardian, not rules and restrictions placed upon companies. Instead, make it easier for parents or guardians to figure out whether each individual book, movie, TV show, graphic novel, whatever is the right pick for their kid. Give as much information as possible. That's my job as a reviewer. And if you are one, then take it upon yourself to give as much information as possible. Talk about trigger warnings because some kids can't read certain stuff. Like it's helpful for me if I'm reading a review of a middle grade book to know if there's zombies in it because then I keep it away from my five-year-old. It's helpful for me to know if there's talk about death, particularly like familial death, death of a parent within a book because then I don't give it to my seven-year-old. I know that. The companies are not going to know that. The, the, the teachers at school might not know that. The library librarians at the library might not know that, but my child's librarian knows because I told her. That's my job. Why are we not, as a community, a book community advocating, if we all actually care and we're not just feigning care about ages 11 to 15 and younger, like you, you're allowed to give a shit about my kids too. You can advocate
advocate for more resources for parents. There are really good websites out there. Now some of them lean a little bit into purity culture, but I still find it helpful to look at commonsensemedia.com. That is a great resource for parents, I feel, because it tells you what's in the book, it gives you like a full synopsis, and you can take what you need and leave what you don't with Common Sense Media when it comes to that. Uh, it's really helpful for me as a parent because they give enough information that I'm able to figure out whether or not my kid is going to get upset over zombies or death or whether or not I'm going to get upset over things like miscarriage because I have trauma surrounding miscarriage and I will have a panic attack if I read it. That is up to the individual parent. That is my job. So advocate for more resources for me to protect my children on an individual level because nobody knows how to do that better than I do. And please, if you're going to talk about this, I don't want your opinions. I want evidence-based conversations because when I show up to my school, when I showed up to my school board, every single time I'm having to speak after people who speak over me who do not have parents and who do not have kids in the district and beg please to my school board please listen to me when I am begging you make evidence-based decisions where my kids are concerned and do not listen to random people who come in here with their opinions and their feelings that's not how we decide what's best for kids I'm not gonna read any more of these tweets it's actually making me like really upset <laughs> I'm sorry, I didn't mean to get so upset. It's just, this is, I just hate watching people do Moms for Liberty's work for them. I really, it is really frustrating because I, I literally have to go to the school board on Monday. I have been there three times in the last month fighting against book banners who do not even have kids in the district. We're trying to affect my kid's educational environment with their opinions. I'm tired of people's opinions. I want my kid's school board to make evidence-based decisions and do right by my kid and empower me, the parent, to do right by my kid. That's what I want. Let me tell you about some middle grade books. Um, I did get this in the mail just recently from Penguin. Shout out to Penguin. Um, my kid's gonna love this. This is about a kid who plays, um, actually this kind of looks like my kid. Um, this is about a kid who plays Rubik's Cube and I was like so excited about this because my husband is a huge, huge Rubik's Cube nerd. Um, so I'm really excited to be able to give this to my kid. Um, I, I just had to film a video before I was allowed to give it to him because I wanted to make sure that I, you know, got it in video and talked about it before he got his frankly corn dog covered hands all over it. So this is about a 12 year old but this is totally fine for my seven year old. I did read it and it is just a delight. It's about um, how his goal is to do the national championships in Las Vegas and he's up against like a nine year old cube prodigy. It's really cute. I'm very excited about this one. So if you are in if you're if you have a kid who is into graphic novels here is a one from coming out from Penguin. I'm super excited about this. One that I was sent by author Lindsay Puckett who is an absolute delight and has a YouTube channel actually hold on I have to show you something so Lindsay actually actually sent me this back in like September and I did read it at the beginning of this year um, I've just been swamped but this is about a disabled girl and Lindsay was nice enough to send me this bracelet that's uh, it, she sent me it during disability pride month so this is a disability pride bracelet and that was just so <laughs> it was just so nice of her. I cried getting this package it was just the nicest thing so I did read this and I super enjoyed it so much that I actually bought my niece a copy this is the Odds by Lindsay Puckett and it's Scooby-Doo meets a series of unfortunate events. So Begonia or Bug is our main character and she lives in a retirement home with all of these you know adoptive grandparents of hers who all have an oddity and Begonia suffers from debilitating chronic pain and she gets migraines and that's why this book made me cry and feel very seen. I wanted to read you this piece of it it says he doesn't understand what it's like living with pain like that how it's not just in your body but it exhausts the mind too how a quiet room can be just as much therapy as a doctor even as an adult I find myself seen in middle grade <laughs> begonia wants an oddity too all of her grandparents have like a magic power or like a like a quirk uh, ma like a magical quirk called an oddity she does not have one and she needs to get her oddity by her 11th birthday or she's not gonna be able to live with her 53 grandparents as their adopted granddaughter in this uh, retirement home anymore so she's trying to find this magical artifact that will help her get her oddity. And it says, along the way, she might discover more than she bargained for, the dangers of letting abilities and disabilities define her. I just can't tell you how much I appreciate. I did not realize that what was happening to me when I was a kid was I was getting migraines. I've had them since I was a kid. And having that in a book is so important to me that I, I only tabbed that one piece. This is so, so good. It's so much fun. It's so whimsical, but it's also like really important and having really important conversations that kids should be able to have. So if your kids like a little bit of spooky stuff, um, there is like ghost stuff in this, but
but like something like, I don't know, like magical house like Encanto. And also if you have a kid that suffers with chronic pain, look no further than The Odds by Lindsay Puckett. She also has another book called The Glass Witch. Thank you so much, Lindsay, again for sending me this. This was such a good book. You really knocked it out of the park. My niece is gonna love it. Another one I wanted to talk about was The Last Quintista by Donna Barbara, Barbara Higuera. This is about a girl named Petra Pena who wants to be a uh, Quintista storyteller just like her abuelita, but Earth is destroyed by a comet and her and her family and a couple hundred other people are chosen to journey to a new planet to carry on the human race. But unfortunately, when Petra wakes up, she can't find her family and she is the only person who remembers Earth. And now the people in charge are a collective who have taken over the ship. And Petra now is the carrier of the stories of Earth and she has to fight this collective for hope of the future. Another one, The Jumbies by Tracy Baptiste. This is such a good one. This is about a girl named Corinne Lemaire and it's uh, Caribbean folklore. Corinne Lemaire claims she isn't afraid of anything, not scorpions, not the boys who tease her, and certainly not jumbies. They're just tricksters made up by parents to frighten their children. Then one night Corinne chases an agouti all the way into the forbidden forest and shining yellow eyes follow her to the edge of the trees. They couldn't belong to a jumbie, or could they? The very next day a beautiful stranger named Severine visit Cor visits Corinne's house. Danger is in the air. Severine plans to claim the entire island for the jumbies. Corinne must call on her courage and her friends and learn to use ancient magic she didn't know she possessed to save her island home. I have nothing but good things to say about this. It's so cute. It's so fun. And I really love the folklore, the like magical entities in here. And Corinne is such a great main character. She's so, uh, she's just, she's got so much personality and she's so fun. And she just wants to like keep her island and her dad safe. I loved it. And it's a little spooky, but not too spooky. Another great middle grade book. This whole series is great. Gregor the Overlander by Su Suzanne Collins. This is about a boy named Gregor and his sister Boots. Their father has gone missing and they are, well, <laughs> but Gregor certainly gets parentified and has to take care of Boots and he's just a kid himself. They fall through a grate in their laundry room and end up in the Underland, which is a realm where humans coexist with giant rats and spiders. And Gregor's arrival was actually foretold. There is prophecies by a guy, I think his name was Sandwich. And Gregor doesn't want to be a, a part of any of this. He just wants to get Boots safely home, his sister. But then he realizes, oh, well, I think that m I could solve the mystery of what happened to my father here. And he, in fact, does. So he uh, embarks on all these adventures. It's like a seven book series and I highly, highly rec rec recommend it. I don't have my copy of this book anymore, but it's Amari and the Night Bro Brothers by B.B. Alston. I gave it to my niece as I tend to do when I love a middle grade book. So Amari, Amari Peters and her mom um, lived with her brother and her brother had received scholarships to attend schools. He was a golden boy, her brother Quentin, who she loved, and then he goes missing and Amari feels like nobody cares about this. And then Amari finds a briefcase in her brother Quentin's stuff and she finds out that he left her a nomination for the Bureau of Supernatural Affairs. So Amari trying to find out what happened to her brother goes and takes this opportunity. And here's where she finds out that there are dragons and mermaids and yeti and dwarves. And in fact, her roommate is a were dragon. I loved the roommate. So Amari has to compete against all these other kids. And then she, coming to find out, has an illegal magical, magical ability. And also there is an evil magician threatening the supernatural world. Her classmates start to, th classmates start th to think that she is an enemy. She only has like one friend in this whole scenario, but she has to pass. She has to make it through try out. She has to make it into the bureau in order to find out what happened to Quentin. Here are some that I own but have not read yet. Last Gamer Standing by Katie Zhao. This is one that I am planning on giving to my niece. And by the way, Scholastic has this great thing that says appeals to five to seventh grade readers, reading, great, reading level grade five. This is but one of the ways in which publishers can make it easier for parents to decide whether or not a book is right for their kids. This is about a girl named Raina Cheng and in her world gaming is everything and that would appeal to honestly my kid right now. He's obsessed with games. With kids training for the big leagues from a young age, the competition is fierce. Yet despite Raina's rising status and skills in a popular virtual battle royale, no one knows who she is. Gaming is still a boys club and young women face a lot of harassment. When Raina qualifies for the Dayhold Junior Tournament, she knows she's got what it takes to win. Losing is not an option. Not if she wants to help pay her mother's medical bills and make her professional esports dreams come true. But when an anonymous troll threatens to dox her if she doesn't withdraw from the competition, Raina will have to confront the toxic gaming community head-on. With her dreams and the ca 
cash prize on the line. It's game on. I think that's so cute. It's so cute. I bought this. I think I pre-ordered it when I found out it was coming out because I was um, following Katie Zhao on Twitter and she's just lovely. So um, I did pre-order this for my niece and I plan to review it and read it before I gave it to her. Um, so I'm probably going to audiobook it and I'm going to give her the physical copy. I'm really excited about this one. And then if my kid likes it then or if, if it seems like something my kid would like then I'll give it to him as well. Another one I have but have not read it is uh, Root Magic by Eden Royce. It's 1963 and things are changing for Jezebel Turner. Her beloved grandmother has just passed away. The local police deputy won't stop harassing her family. With school integration arriving in South Carolina, Jez and her twin brother Jay are about to begin the school year with a bunch of new kids. But the biggest change comes when Jez and Jay turn 11 and their uncle Doc tells her tells them he's going to train them in root work. Jez and Jay have always been fascinated by the African-American folk magic that has been the legacy of their family for generations, especially the curious potions and powders Doc and Gran would make for the people on their island. But Jez soon finds out that her family's true power goes beyond small charms and elixirs and not a moment too soon because when evil, both natural and supernatural, comes to show itself in town, it's going to take every bit of the magic she has inside her to see her through. Another one I have is A Storm of Strawberries by Joe Cotterill and this uh, says it's for ages 10 to 14. I really love this cover. This is really pretty art. Darby is 12 years old and has Down syndrome. Her favorite things are music, chocolate, and her big sister Katie. It's a big weekend for Darby. The family's annual chocolate hunt is here and it's all she can think about. Well, that and spending time with her big sister. But Katie's friend Lissa is staying over for the weekend and she seems to be stealing all of Katie's attention. And to make things worse, their strawberry farm is struck by a tornado. Suddenly, it's as though both the chocolate hunt and her sister are slipping away from her. Although the family is equipped for the brutal weather, they aren't prepared for the storm of emotions that surface when a hidden truth amid all the turmoil is brought to light. With tensions rising within her family, can Darby mend what's been broken even when it seems like no one is listening to her? I think this might be the only book on my shelf that features a main character with Down syndrome, so I think that that's great. So if you're looking for a main character with Down syndrome, Storm of Strawberries is an option. I also have, it's downstairs so I'm not going to grab it, but it's Some Kind of Happiness by Claire Legrand. Claire Legrand wrote a YA series that I really loved, which is Fairy Born. This is the second book, but I have not read any of her middle grade books and she has a lot of middle grade books. Things Finley Hart does not want to talk about. Her parents who are having problems but pretend like they're not. Being sent to her grandparents' house for the summer. Never having met said grandparents. Her blue days. When life feels overwhelming and it's hard to keep her head up. This happens a lot. Finley's retreat is the Everwood, a forest kingdom that exists inside the pages of her notebook until she discovers the endless woods behind her grandparents' house and realizes the Everwood is real and it's in trouble. With the help of her cousins, Finley sets out on a mission to save it. But as the mysteries pile up and Finley's reality and fantasy start to collide, she realizes that if she wants to save the Everwood, she'll first have to save herself. I just found it. It's not downstairs. It's right here. So I really like um, this theme of like <laughs> kid house surroundings outside. It's, it's really cute and I feel like this is also one that my niece doesn't like things with a ton of magic in it. She likes more like Encanto with like real world, maybe a little bit of magical house. This one, as far as I can tell, it does not have a particular age range, but it does say that the subjects are depression, mental health, um, fiction, family problems, secrets, fantasy, family, um, social issues, new experience, depression, mental illness. So all of that is just in the front cover. So that that's another way in which parents can decide whether or not this is a good pick or not for their kid. And again, public Publishers, sure, can expand on that information. Changing the art is not something that helps. Giving more information about the book is something that helps. So adding further information on the inside of the cover is maybe something that if you're worried about kids picking up the wrong book, you can advocate for. Put more in information on the front cover, but normally it says what the age range is at a minimum. So all parents have to do is not just look at a cover, but turn a page. It says young readers. So like, <laughs> it doesn't say adult. Like that's your first clue. Another one by Claire Legrand, and this was actually sent to me by Zach from Zach Tries to Read years ago. So this is The Cavendish Home for Boys and Girls by Claire Legrand. This is another one of her middle grade books. It is not related to some kind of happiness. Victoria cannot stand messes. She has perfect grades, perfect hair, and she always follows the rules. So she surprises even herself when she befriends Lawrence, who can't tuck in his shirt or comb his hair. Lawrence, who Victoria is determined to fix. With a little work, he can be as perfect as she is. But then Lawrence goes missing. When Victoria starts investigating, she soon starts to realize that not only he's not the only kid who's disappeared, lots of kids in Belleville have vanished, misfit kids to be exact, and all roads lead to the mysterious Cavendish home for boys and girls. Kids who go there to come out smarter, prettier, or better, or they don't come out at all. It's up to Victoria to save her friend and her town, even if it means getting a little messy. So on the back of this, it actually says books for young readers for 
ages 10 and up. So maybe we can check out this book. Yep, it says ages 10 to 12. So like the age ranges normally are on the book. So again, every opportunity is given to me, the parent, to figure out if this is the right age range for my kid, which actually this is almost the right age range for my kid. So I might, I might have him read this soon. Another one, which I did see at a bookstore in Alexandria when I was there um, just a couple weeks ago, but I did not pick up uh, because they did not have book one was Sir Callie and the Champion of Helston. I do have the audiobook for this, but I wanted a physical copy for my niece. Unfortunately, they did not have book one. I was really sad. They do have the new ones, which was great. Uh, so this is a series about Sir Callie. In a world where girls learn magic and boys train as knights, 12-year-old non-binary Callie doesn't fit any in, anywhere. And you know what? That's just fine. Callie has always known exactly what they want to be, and they're not about to let a silly thing like gender rules stand in their way. When their ex-hero dad is summoned back to the royal capital of Helston to train a hopeless crown prince as war looms, Callie lunges at the opportunity to finally prove themselves worthy of Helston's great and powerful. Except the intolerant great and powerful look at Callie and only see girl. Trapped in Helston's rigid hierarchy, Callie discovers they aren't alone. There's Elowen, the Chancellor's brilliant daughter, whose unparalleled power is being stifled. Edwin, Elowen's twin brother, locked in a desperate fight to win his father's approval. And Willow, the crown prince who was never meant to be king. Callie and their new friends quickly find themselves embedded in an ancient war. The only hope to defeat the dragons and witches outside the kingdom lies in first defeating the bigotry within. So Witchlings by Clarabelle Ortega, which I bought for my kids at my kids scholastic book fair last year which they didn't do this year but I'm really excited about this Clarabelle is lovely you should follow her on social media seven Salazar can't wait to be placed in the most powerful coven with her best friend but on the night of the ceremony in front of the entire town seven isn't placed in one of the five covens she's a spare spare covens have fewer witches are less powerful and are looked down on by everyone even worse when seven and two other spares perform the magic circle to seal their coven and cement themselves as sisters it doesn't work they're stuck as witchlings and will never be able to perform powerful magic. Seven invokes her only option, the impossible task. The three spares will be assigned an impossible task. If they work together and succeed at it, their coven will be sealed and they'll gain their full powers. If they fail, well, the last coven to make an attempt being ended up being turned into toads forever. Maybe friendship can be the most powerful magic of all. Now, I've referenced my nieces probably multiple fucking times at this point in this video. <laughs> I talk about them all the time whenever I talk about middle grade books. Um, so I don't have a copy of this, but I did buy a bunch of books for them. I buy a bunch of books for them from thrift books every year and um, so I can give them like a whole stack and one of the books that I bought one year for my oldest niece which she then gave to her sister after she read it was Sal and Gabby Break the Universe. My niece loved it so much she cosplayed for at, at school and she went as Gabby for school which is making my aunt dreams come true. <laughs> I was so proud. I was like, why did nobody send me a picture? I was I was so proud of her. So um, they really love Sal and Gabby Break the Universe, but they also love the Featherwing Saga, which I believe is a Christian series. So if you're looking for a Christian middle grade series, Featherwing Saga, saga is great. And I also bought my younger niece, Click, which is a graphic novel about like finding friendship. They're really into graphic novels. They really have a special interest in hearing stories about the Holocaust. Again, my youngest niece is like gearing away from fantasy and, and only likes like a little bit of magical realism. So I think that um, they have have not read Mouse yet so I think that I will read through this and then decide whether or not um, their you know mom and, and dad will, will be cool with that and then I'll give um, them a copy for Christmas because they really like to read about the Holocaust they learned about it in school and they were like well we want to learn more and they started reading more fiction about it and my niece dabbled in some nonfiction, I believe so I'm gonna this is like the whole the whole of Mouse and this is a graphic novel by Art Spiegelman about um, like the depicting um, Jewish folks as mice, mice and the Nazis as as, uh, cats and this was sent to me by John E. Thank you so much John um, and this is actually a banned book that I'm going to be talking about when I finish it um, in an upcoming video where I talk about book banning which is something I do here. A book that is this is from Penguin Teen. Thanks Penguin Teen for sending me this. This is technically a teen book however I would still give this to my 11 and 13 year old niece so like again you really have to like know the kid, um, know their parents and read the content in order to figure out what's age appropriate and what's not. I would give this to my, I probably will give this to my 11 year old niece. This is um, Huda, F, Huda F Cares by Huda Fami. I've read all of Huda Fami stuff and I love it. And this is just about Huda and her family going to Disney for a family vacation and trying to get along between her and her sisters. It's incredibly age appropriate and it also teaches like what it's like being a Muslim teen navigating through the world. And also Huda Fami as depicted in this book, Huda is, this is a little bit fictionalized. Um, Huda 
uh, is a reader and like you know geeks out with other readers at Disney World so I think that I would give this to my 11 and 13 year old niece um, so you know it just is really up to like each individual person and kid and parent you really have to like do your due diligence know the kid so if you're looking for something that's um, if you have a reader who is a middle grade technical reader but reads older stuff and likes graphic novels this I feel is age appropriate for basically any 11 year old okay that's it that, that's my middle grade recommendations and uh, <laughs> some thoughts on some middle grade discourse going on right now I hope that you enjoyed the video let me know your comments and questions down below thanks for watching leave me your favorite middle grade read down below okay thanks for watching see you next time bye and before I go I have to say thank you for being a friend to my therapy bills patrons and those are Alexander Ashley H Astrid P Brittany Bobitney Cami Choco's trash for Japanese mysteries and thrillers Chris the Horror Therapist, Dalton Smith, DJ Rocktopus, Ellie, Emerald Dodge, Emperor's New Blues, Aaron with two E's, Eric, Galaxy Bot, Jay Naya, Jack, Jess, John E, Julie D, Kelly No K, Casey McKenzie, Kate W, Kiara, Quinn, Lady Kitty Bug, Grand Pooba of the Church of Josh. Y'all are killing me. <laughs> Lemon Jelly, Lex, Lily B, Little Crow, Peggy, are you serious? <laughs> Max B, Mommy Zombie, Mixer Boneless, Alice, Panoramic Demon, Rachel C, Rain, Reese, SJ, Samar, Sad Witch Bree, Scarlet, Shiny, SMK, Spoopy, Steph, Two Orbit, Urchin Audrey, White Raven 13, Zorvictia, and Chai Guy. Thank you all so much for being here and for being a friend. And last but not least, I have to say thank you for being a friend to my Potato Source Marxist patrons, and those are Alejandra, Althea, Amanda, Amanda D, Andy, Angelica, Artie the Ninth, Ava, Ballads and Bookends, Beck, Blake Levin Pants, Blythe, Bookish Brain Rot, Bookish by Jenna, Bree, Caitlin, Cardinal Ginger, Carlin, Casper, Kate W, Catherine, Kathy, Chris, CJ, Cole, Colleen, Corwin, Cosmic, Darius, Danielle M, Darren, Desiree Michelle, Diet Goth, Dill enthusiasts <laughs> those being right next to each other is hilarious dorian dorotea et cosgrove writes ebby emily a emily l emma emma oa aaron ezra moon fiona gadarn hannah c harpy kiro Haley g ilianaka jm Tennant, jay is on olympus jelly v jen michelle gender queer jenny g jessis sue jill jillian r jojo bookish cat h Catherine, katie katie l Kaylee C, Kayala, Kendra, KMTB, Laughing Cat Dog, Laura Garcia, Lauren, Lauren G, Lazarus Ray, Library of Scars, Lindsay, Lisa B, Lisa L, LP, Lou Siri, Lustful Octopus, Martin, Madison, Man Eating Plant, Marcella, Marquita, Malara, Mentally Unwell, May, Molly, James, Natalie, Never, Nicole G, Nicole R, Nyan Binary, Paige P, Penny Chilling, Fox Glove, Rachel B, Reba, Rebecca, Rebecca R, Rivi, Ronnie, Rosie Thorns, Rowan, Sicoria, Sadie, Saint Bringer, Sakia Lume, Samantha O, Sammy C, Sarah H, Sarah the Bear, Sarah Z, Shamed, Shannon, Sheen Onion, Sean, Super Evil Sam. <laughs> That's a good one. T Delegati, Tay, Talia, Three Old Dogs, Tiana, Trash Can Teddy, Triple M, Tito Phoenix, and Writer A. Thank you all so much for being here and for being a friend and for being willing to listen to two and a half hours of me talking. Oh my God. If you're still here, I'm shocked. Anyway, thank you so much. Mm -hmm.